Right. Are we ready? Yep. Right. Okay. Let's go. Hello and welcome back to Electoral Dysfunction. This episode has the prize of being our earliest ever recording. It's not even 8 a.m. So well done, everyone, for actually turning up. Now, I am in the studio. Jess, where are you? I am in Birmingham and the earliness of this recording means I may have to take a small interlude to wake my children up. <laughs> but you are dressed. We're all dressed. So I mean, that's I've got pyjama good. bottoms on, if I'm honest. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. The classic, the classic <laughs> yeah. Zoom call. Mm-hmm. Absolutely love it. Ruth, where are you? You're at home. I am at home. I'm going to be confined to barracks for the next four weeks because I'm not allowed to yeah. drive because I've, I've had an operation. So I'm, I'm a bit walking wounded at the moment. I had to um, I had to get my wife to help dress me. This morning, Ruth's think, got a so. sling on. But she's on the it's mend. It's pretty pathetic. I am on the mend. <laughs> so much this week. We've got Rishi Sunak's anti-smoking laws on our agenda. We're going to ask also what makes a good foreign secretary. Is it Lord Cameron? And we've got more voice notes just as you asked, Ruth. They've been coming in. This is Lauren. After listening to the Angela Rayner episode and you talking about her being working class, how do we get more working class women involved in politics? Thank you, Lauren, for that. Well, you can WhatsApp voice note us on 07934 200 444. Send them in. We really want your questions. The House of Commons canteen, serious political ideology stuff, whatever you want. We've always got time to answer questions. Something about Parliament you'd like to know. We can do it all. (laughs) Now, you can also send an email to electoraldysfunction at sky.uk. Look, we were going to start today with the smoking bill, but before we get on to that, I want to talk about a story because it is quite extraordinary. It's about an MP called Mark Menders. And the allegation in the Times is in December, Mark Menders allegedly called his 78-year-old former campaign manager at 3.15am, got her out of bed, and said to her bad people had locked him in a flat and told her he needed £5,000 as a matter of life or death. The claim then is that the office manager paid from a personal bank account some funds and was subsequently reimbursed by campaign funds. Now, this story broke by the brilliant investigative journalist I used to work with there, Billy Kember. The Tories have suspended the whip from Mark Menzies. We got this from a spokesperson for the Chief Whip, Simon Hart. He said, following a call with Chief Whip, Mark Menzies has agreed to relinquish the Conservative Whip pending the outcome of an investigation. So he's had the whip removed. And we also have this from Mark Menzies, a statement saying, I strongly dispute the allegations put to me. I fully complied with all the rules for declarations as there is an investigation ongoing. I won't be commenting further. So, I mean, where do we start with this? Jess, Ruth, who wants to kick off? What What's the implications for this for the Conservative Party? Ruth, why don't we start with you? I mean, I think, first of all, we just have to, to go at how mad this is. So it's it's not just the allegation that he phoned up a, a volunteer, a 78-year-old, nearly 80-year-old woman mm. volunteer saying, I'm locked in a flat, I'm being held, I'm only going to be released for £5,000, you have to give me the money now. Uh, and then the next morning it had gone up to 6500 because she said, it's three in the morning. No. Mark Menzies had also previously been a PPS and had been on an upward trajectory and then his career kind of almost stopped in Parliament after a Brazilian rent boy went to one of the newspapers, went to one of the tabloids saying that there'd been a, a, a kind of blackmail involved there in terms of giving him money for sex and also buying him drugs, which again, Mark Menzies denied. But, you know, there's just, it's jaw-dropping. Like, the story is utterly jaw-dropping. I don't think there was anything other than the way in which the whip mm. could be suspended. There's also allegations that he asked for campaign funds to pay for private medical bills for him. It is utterly jaw-dropping. Like, it is so out with the bounds of mm. what being a responsible elected member is and how you treat your constituency association that it is staggering, like utterly staggering. Mm. But the Tories were supposedly told about this three months ago mm. and this is the first we're hearing about it. And by reading the story, it looks very much like this lady told a local association, raised the red flag, then told 
uh, the parliamentary authorities, the chief whip, then told CCHQ, which is Tory HQ, mm. nothing's happened, and mm. now she's quoted in the newspapers. So, I mean, it does appear that there's local association wrath about the way they've been treated by this mm. MP. So, you know, I, I, I think this is a, a, a very difficult one, and I would find it difficult to believe that an investigation can be held and he can be cleared in time to stand at a general election. In fact, I would be surprised if he survives the week here and doesn't just resign. Right, OK, so you've made the point that the Conservative Party appear to have known about this. Why has it taken so long for this to come to light? And he has now, you know, is sitting as an independent MP. Just to be clear, you think that he will have to resign as an MP and what, trigger another by-election? Before well, the week's I, out. I think they will try to, I, I think both sides, it's in both sides' interests for that not to happen. So I don't think Mark Menzies wants to walk away right now. But I also don't think that the Conservatives want to have a by-election this close to a general election. Yes, they have a 16,000 majority, but then if they lose it, that makes it worse. Mm. However, it's the sort of seat where if it's just in the mix as part of a general election, it's it's probably not right at the top of of the, the kind of target seats for the Labour Party. So they probably get to hold the seat. If, if he stays there, even as an independent, the Tories more than likely hold the seat at a general. If it goes to a by-election, all bets are off. Interesting, Jess, isn't it? Because um, there's been lots of talk about Angie Rayner and her tax mm-hmm. affairs and the stuff around her council house. Labour will presumably be, what What will they do with this? Personally, I think that he has no choice but to resign and force a by-election. This story, I, I think it's going to run and run throughout the week. A member of his parliamentary staff was called on to go and take ca- their own cash, allegedly, to a place of danger. Uh, as somebody who has these parliamentary aides, they often get called, I mean, they're just my staff and they work for the people of Birmingham Yardley. I, I was going to set my alarm for 3am in the morning and try and ask any of them, if I asked any of them for six quid, let alone six grand, they would give me very, very short shrift. When you put it into the context that the Tories have been literally salivating over... Angela Rayner's nine-year-ago sale of a council house in her blended family, which, you know, we all agreed when we spoke about this last week, she deserves as much scrutiny as anybody else, and there's no reason why she shouldn't have to answer those questions. But when you put this into this context, it is just that they have... I saw a journalist um, saying that it's a bit like, you know, in a sort of old school, like... Uh, Looney Tunes cartoon where somebody like sets a really, really, really elaborate trap and then the anvil falls on their head. It does feel a little bit like that is the Tories have have misstepped this. And it was always so obvious that going after Angela Rayner in this way was always going to come and bite Mm. them back in the arse. So, I mean, Ruth, I imagine that the WhatsApps have been flying around as you and colleagues have kind of absorbed this story. I mean, what is the mood just kind of back on heels, absolutely reeling within the Tory party, another massive scandal issue that the PM now has to deal with. So I I think in terms of the mood in the Tory party, there is that sense that every time we start to get on the front foot about something, something comes and knocks us off. And also just the the kind of the number now of of kind of scandals that are coming along. It, It feels sort of end of days. It feels like the 92 to 97 sort of parliament. And you can kind of see the party sort of splintering in front of your eyes. Just to be clear, as we've talked about him a lot, Mark Menzies has said, I strongly dispute the allegations put to me. I fully complied with all the rules for declarations. As there's an investigation ongoing, I will not be commenting further. That is what Mark Menzies has to say for himself. But I imagine that this story will go mega in the coming days. But look, let's carry on about the Tories and good weeks, bad weeks, because there was a prime minister this week in some ways that felt a bit on the front foot. And I say this because it's the smoking bill. It's Rishi Sunak's plan to effectively ban smoking in the UK by increasing the legal age for cigarette sales by one year Every year, it means people born in or after 2009 will never be able to legally buy cigarettes. And I'm conflicted really about whether or not this is an electoral dysfunction moment for him or not. Because on the one hand, Rishi Sunak has got 
a piece of legislation through that could end up being his legacy, right? It's a massive mm-hmm. social policy if you think about it. But on the other hand, it has sparked again rows within the Conservative Party. It was a free vote. That means MPs get to vote with their conscience. They're not whipped into what to do. But it also prompted this big rebellion on Rishi Sunak's benches with 57 MPs voting against this key piece of legislation. And that included some of the leadership hopefuls that we have talked about. Our favourite Priti Patel, she abstained. Mm. Kemi Badenot, the business secretary, voted against the bill. Penny Mordaunt abstained. Robert Jenrick and Swella Bravman, they also voted against. You could talk about it in a way be in something to reveal the schisms again in the Conservative Party and those with an eye on the leadership talking about how it was profoundly unconservative, not least the words of Liz Truss there. She said it was unconservative. Ruth, would you have voted against it and do you agree with Liz Truss that it's unconservative? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the ones where I'm a little bit frustrated with Rishi Sunak because he didn't need to have the level of rebellion that he had. As a policy, it sort of came out of nowhere. He just said he was going to do it. And then he didn't say anything more about it until the vote suddenly popped Mm. up. And like it's not rolling the pitch. It's not handling the party. I mean, there are absolutely ways in which you can have social change where different values of conservatism collide and come into conflict. And they're they're difficult for a party. They're difficult for any party. Mm. But but you can make the argument for them. So, so 20 years ago, we had a, a big thing, a big clash in the party about the use of CCTV and civil liberties versus the fact that we're hard on law and order and we want crime to be brought down. And, and you know, that was a, a big kind of ideological clash within the party. And, and obviously, you know, CCTV and making sure that people were practically and pragmatically safe and that you were able to catch criminals sort of won over the civil liberty argument. And people are kind of cool with it now. And similarly... Cameron, when he was talking about equal marriage, went out and made the pitch for it and said, look, here's all of the reasons why conservatives think marriage is a good idea. And therefore, it is conservative to say that extending marriage is a good idea. In terms of this bill itself, Rishi Sunak's done none of the hard work. He's done none of the heavy lifting to sell this Mm. or sell the conservative parts of it, which is stuff like saving the NHS money. That's good sort of public finances. That's a profoundly conservative thing to do. Like, there's ways to make a conservative argument here. Mm. He's just, he's done none of it. In terms of whether I would have voted for it, this is one of those policies where I, I genuinely, I don't care. I'm not impassioned <laughs> about it one way or the other. <laughs> like, like I, I think not having people smoking is good. In the end, I think this is going to be one of the ones that, if it happens, you know, and it gets enacted, it's going to be a massive gift to the Labour Party He's the incoming government because it will save the NHS money down the road. It will make us a healthier society. Probably will be a legacy for Rishi Sunak. OK, look, Jess, you and I, we were smokers, weren't we? I used to smoke absolutely mm-hmm. loads. It took me years to give up smoking and I have not touched mm-hmm. a cigarette now for about six years. I just if I touch one, I'm back in the smoky mm-hmm. zone. So I just can't touch them. <laughs> and, and Jess, you're sitting there and you've got your vape going. I do. Uh, I my brother's vape. my brother John. Shout out to him. He's just given up smoking fifty plus days. He's on his vape. He asked me to do that in the podcast. So can we keep that in? <laughs> <laughs> to but, be fair, fifty days like the first fifty yeah. days are the hardest. Yeah, like, yeah, no, God I'm, love him. Like, he's done well. I am so proud. I am so proud of my brother for giving up smoking. Mm-hmm. But Jess, going back to it. So you, Ruth said she doesn't care. You yeah. do it's, care, like it's don't not you? that I don't, but no, I, like, I, I don't, find it yeah. hard to get impassioned about. Yeah. Like it's not okay, one of those yeah. ones where All I'm right. going to go to the wall for All it. Right, let, I, like, I do care. Both of my children, unfortunately, were born before 2009, so this doesn't reach them. But what I found really interesting about the debate is that all the right wing conservatives who were standing up and saying, "Oh, you know, we're, this is totally unconservative," all of them were saying as well, "I'm a non-smoker," and it's mm-hmm. like, can you ask a smoker their opinion? Because no smoker wishes that they'd started smoking when they were young. Mm. And actually, any barrier to that, I think, is a good thing. But look, I actually think Rishi Sunak announced it because the Labour Party was going to announce it, and he definitely needs a legacy. 
Yeah, I was watching the debate and there was this moment where Wes Streetin said, this is a Labour bill and we're going to pass the bill. And then the camera zoomed to Liz Truss's face and she looked like she was sucking on a lemon. It was a piece of parliamentary gold. If you're into that sort of thing, go back and watch it if you if you want to see Liz Truss sucking on a lemon. But on that issue about the ideology around it, Ruth, you know, we've mm. talked a lot about the battle for the soul of the Tory party going into this election and then out the other side. This was a real moment, wasn't it, ideologically about, it sort of sparked this debate about what do the Conservatives stand for and which wing of the party take the mantle after the election. Did you see it in those terms a bit, Ruth? Well, I think everybody everybody knows which wing of the party is going to take the mantle after the election, which is why anybody that thinks that they're going to be a candidate for the next leader of the Tory party. And anyone that, that wants to be a contender knows what side of that argument that they had to vote on. And, and also, it's a sign of weakness from the Prime Minister that he made this a free vote, because it's not a free vote. This is not a free vote issue. This is not a moral issue. This is not abortion or, you know, assisted dying or a vote of conscience. It's, a, it's about, <laughs> you know, it's retail law. Like, this is not a conscience issue. But he knew that he would have a rebellion and he knew it would be from ministers. So he he had to make it so. And, and you know, again, it's, it's just a sign of weakness and bad party management. I was thinking about it on those terms as well. And then I thought, you know what? He's got the first vote. This is, I should say, the first vote. I mean, it's it's not into law, but he's pushing this no. bill through the Commons. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he's like, I don't care if... It's about his personal legacy, isn't it? And I, would, is... I would love to see more of Rishi Sunak not caring and just doing stuff that yeah. he wants to do. I would love it. But everything that he seems to do is squaring off one end or appeasing another or not trying to cause a schism and, and all the rest of it. And it's just like... Do you know what? You've got a limited... Every Prime Minister has a limited mm. time as Prime Minister. This one more so because he's a long way into his party being in government. Like, mm. have some things that you want to do in politics and get them done. And and yeah. more than that, go out and make the argument for them because he's perfectly equipped to be able to. But he's not doing it because this vote came out of nowhere. Then he did nothing in between the announcement and bringing the bill forward. Like, go mm. out and do the hard graft. Of poli- enjoy it. Like, the bit of politics I love is making the argument. I love it. I love the mm. debate of politics. I love being able to stand up and explain why I want to do something, why it's going to make things better. You know, I agree that maybe it won't fix everything, but it, it will be a step in the right direction. Like, I love the, the pragmatism and, and the debate and the clash, like the creative clash of politics is what is appealing to politics mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. One final thought on this, because Ruth talks about, you know, he should have whipped it. It should have been a public health issue. Mm-hmm. But in the end, it sort of turned out, at least on the conservative benches, as an ideology issue. Oh, yeah. What what do you think about that, Jess? I think for some people it was an ideology issue. Genuinely they are libertarian and they they hold libertarian views. I, I have absolutely no doubt about that. So if David Cameron had put this forward when Liz Truss was in the cabinet, she'd absolutely not have had those views. It's not ideological for Jenrick and Badenoch. If, of all of them, I, I, I mean, not just because we on this podcast have really backed the horse that is Pretty Patel. You two have. I, I, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm backing her with favour. I'm saying I think she's got the best chance of becoming the next leader. She's our uh, secret pick. Like, I actually think she probably has an ideological view about it. But this was a load of people wanting to, you know, land a blow on Rishi Sunak. Mm. And next week it will be something else. Mm. However, being in Parliament on the day of the vote, I very rarely see Rishi Sunak. He's not... And even before he was the Prime Minister, even when he was just a backbencher... He's not like a man in the tea room. He He's mm. not like a man who has lots and lots of friends. He doesn't have like a hinterland within the Conservative Party. And watching him sort of having to, like standing in the chamber as we were voting on this, trying to look like he was totally relaxed. You know, like yeah. when... A boy comes into the pub that you fan- uh, and you fancy him and you're at the bar and you do that fake laughing like with your friend. You're like, <laughs> like it, it was so like that. He was stood in the chamber of the House of Commons talking to groups of people. You never see him talking to anyone. And he was doing this like, oh, I'm so relaxed. I'm so calm. He looked weak. Okay. Even though I actually think in substantive, him going, I don't care and I'm just going to do it. He didn't mm. do it right. Ruth is exactly right. Mm. He didn't make the arguments. But the idea that he comes out of it looking particularly stronger, 
And there's nobody, I'm going to tell you nobody, apart from people who run tobacco or vape companies, has been in touch with me about this. I think we did see a bit of Sunak letting rip this week. And the reason I say that was at PMQs, I think he did show a bit of ankle, and I'm not talking about his short trousers. What I'm talking about... <laughs> is the way in which I think it took Starmer by surprise. He disavowed Liz Truss, not once, but twice. So Starmer mm. goes in, attacking Liz Truss's economic record. Gold for Labour that this is back in the spotlight. And, and, and the Prime Minister finally kind of called her out, not once, but twice. I've been trying for months in interviews to get him to an express a clear view about Liz Truss. Politically, it seems to me sensible for him, if he wants to show the public he's different from Truss and Johnson, he has to criticise them, but he doesn't seem to want to. He kind of did that this week. Jess, were you in the chamber? Did you did you get that vibe? I wasn't actually there, but you're right. But this week, the reason he probably cracked this week is because she cracked in front of the entire nation. And I think she... You know, this is terrible terminology for somebody who comes from the background I do. She was sort of asking for Sunak to have a go at her, wasn't she? So actually, it helped Liz trust that Rishi Sunak finally cracked on this point. It will help her sell books and she was goading him all week. If you've missed this publicity blitz, and you must have been in a dungeon if you have, because this week we just have had wall to wall Liz Truss. This is about her book, new book, Ten Years to Save the West. Now, given the uh, manner in which she left office, you might have wondered whether a period of, of silence might have been welcome, certainly would have been welcomed by Rishi Sunak. But um, she had an advance of 1,500 quid for this book. But I have to say that actually it's sold out now on Amazon. So, you know, there is some appetite for it. Let's just have a bit of I've got a couple of passages here. She writes that the conservative movement across the West has been faltering for almost a generation, adding that we have conservative politicians accepting extremist, environmentalist dogma and wokeism. She argues there are leftists in the Conservative Party. I should point out that Liz Truss was a Liberal Democrat, did support Remain, and now has gone on quite the political journey, hasn't she? Ruth, are you one of those Conservative leftists that Liz Truss thinks uh, are taking are. her party the wrong way? I don't think I'm taking her party anywhere. I think it's fair to say that us dripping wets are miles away from the, the centre. Our time has been and gone with, with Cameron. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think every party is a very broad church. No wing of a party has the right to be in the ascendancy forever. You know, we had our kind of golden period under Cameron and now it's the other wing's turn. I, I mean, let's see how su electorally successful they are at it. But it, it's the same with the Labour Party. <laughs> you know, you had the new Labour years are very different from the Corbyn years. And, and there are swings within parties as well as swings between parties when it comes to the electorate. But I, I did notice you mentioned her advance there of £1,500. I think... Um, other prime ministers have had significantly more. Mind you, he, she she did, had had less time in office, I think. <laughs> Do you think it's like pounds pounds for hours? But the thing is, she got a pitiful advance. There is a sort of sense that she... And she's been asked about this. Chris Mason did a great old job in a rival podcast. Actually, should I even mention this? But to be <laughs> fair to Chris, he kind of said to her, you know, you, you left office as a joke. You became a joke in the nation. And, and, and he talked about the letter. She didn't like this at all. And she, she rebutted all of this. But, you know, there is a point that, yeah, she got a tiny advance because people thought they don't need to hear from Liz Truss. She has no credibility. But Ruth, there is a serious point here, isn't there? Which is whether you agree with her or not, what is going on here is Liz Truss is trying to sort of stake her claim on a version of conservatism that she thinks will be in the ascendancy after a general election. I imagine that what she's trying to do is to position herself as somehow being an influential voice in the party still, that she will want to have a role in like the leadership election. She might want to come back into cabinet. She said uh, in another interview that she had unfinished business and didn't rule out running for prime minister again. So number one, there's a serious thing that's going on with Liz Truss thinking that she has, you know, the second chapter here. And another thing is, it's, it's how problematic is that for a Conservative Party who knows, despite what Liz Truss thinks, that she is 
toxic in the mind of the public when it comes to the election. And, and, and Rishi Sunak would like her to go back into that dungeon I was talking about earlier. I do think that something broke in Liz Trust during her whatever, 49 days or whatever it was, because the woman that I had met in many cabinet roles and had spoken to and had been collegiate with is a very different woman to the woman that we're seeing now. And, you know, she used to be happy to chat and be quite open and, and not necessarily fun particularly, but lighthearted and all the rest of it. And, and the woman that we're seeing now is is not that woman. And it's not even like that she's angry. It's it's just a, a very different version of herself than her first 20 years in, in politics mm. would suggest. And yet I think there probably is an element of political calculation that she does want to come back. I, I think, of course, anyone that had been in office for that short a period and for whom it was so catastrophic that they've become a bit of a joke figure will want to rehabilitate themselves. Of course they will. I mean, yeah. political, you know, personal pride as much as anything else. Mm. But I do think that it is troublesome in the way she's trying to go about mm. it. And I, I think the problem that there is there is this lack of authenticity. You know, like you yeah. say, she she was a Lib Dem and she did write some stuff in the Orange Bookers and the way she came up through Cameron. I mean, she was in every cabinet for like 12 years or something like this. And this idea that she is now this sort of freedom-loving libertarian mm. standard bearer of the ideological right, just it's just not authentic mm. because that's not our hinterland. It's not where she comes from. Ruth, can she come back? Liz Truss. Uh, the idea that she's going to become an elder statesman and like a foreign secretary or something, I think is a stretch. OK. Right, Absolutely we'll bookmark that. not. She can't come back, although... On behalf of the Labour Party, I'd like to say, welcome back, Liz. Welcome back, Liz. Let's yeah, we, let, love that's... we love Liz Truss being all over the airwaves. I mean, I think she may, maybe she's been a Lib Dem, she's been a Tory, maybe she's secretly working for the Labour Party currently. Well, let's pause for a break there. Coming up, what makes a good foreign secretary? Liz Truss was foreign secretary once, but um, we're not going to talk about her anymore. We're talking about another blast from the past. Right, welcome back. Now, can we say that the former Prime Minister and now Foreign Secretary, Lord David Cameron, is back on top this week? Ruth? Um, I have to say, I, I think that he's doing a pretty good job as Foreign Secretary and I think it wasn't a bad shout putting him in there. He's certainly been hyperactive. I mean, he's he's been everywhere. He's putting in the miles, the air miles. And also, because he's got that kind of heft as an ex-PM, you know, he's making sure that he's in the rooms that he needs to be and we're being taken seriously. And and I think the United Kingdom, having post-Brexit, had a period of drift and, and folk not really knowing what our place is in the world and us not defining it particularly mm. well. I, I think that's all to the good and you don't have to be a Tory supporter to want the Foreign Secretary in particular to do well because it, mm. it means the country's doing well on the international stage. He's been in Israel this week meeting PM Benjamin Netanyahu before going on to the occupied Palestinian authorities. He's then going to Italy to Capri for a meeting with the G7 foreign ministers. He is absolutely all over the place all the time, isn't he? And it's interesting because he just seems to be given a bit of a free reign to kind of be you know, a proxy for Rishi Sunak almost on the world stage, like the one person in this cabinet where he just has very few allies that he can rely on. Do you, do you think that's fair, Ruth? I think what you have in David Cameron is somebody who is absolutely not jostling for position. He has no wish to leave the Conservative Party again. He's got no ambitions beyond what's happening. I mean, there's clearly... He feels like he had some service still to give and he wants to maybe rehabilitate mm. his, his own legacy. Yes, there's an outcry about the fact that statements that are being made in the mm. Commons have to be made by someone else because the way our constitution works, nobody who's in the Lords is allowed to speak in the Commons from the dispatch box. But apart from that, I mean, I think it would be a pretty hard-hearted individual that thinks that he's not one of the better appointments. They're probably the best foreign secretary since Haig, actually. Hmm. What do you think, Jess? One of the best foreign secretaries since Haig? Look, I think that when David Cameron came in, what a well-kept secret for a start off, because people were not expecting it. Certainly with specific uh, focus on the Middle East, Israel, Palestine issue, people like me who care very, very deeply about this particular issue were quite relieved, actually, that it would be David Cameron dealing with it because he has always, both as the Prime Minister and since, been seen as 
on neither side, if you will, mm. if, if we were to put it so, you know, so, sort of purely, he is a sort of fair actor in this. And so actually in this particular mm. time, it seemed like a good, good fitting for him. I do actually think that in the last couple of weeks on that particular issue, I, I think you're absolutely right that he's not jostling for position. And there is a problem that he's not elected. And that's one of the reasons he's not jostling for position. So it's good for Rishi Sunak. It's not particularly good if you're trying to test the sense of the people in your country that you don't have to worry about them. But, and I, I got very much that David Cameron was doing quite a good job over the Israel-Palestine issue and there'd been a sort of change in sense around it with his involvement. But I, I actually think he has had his wings clipped a bit by Rishi Sunak in the last couple of weeks. I think that there is a division between them on that particular issue which you wouldn't necessarily know and actually I can't investigate because I can't ask David Cameron any questions. Because just this is the issue is that he's because he's unelected he sits in the House of Lords but yeah. he's doing foreign policy and it means that you know when you see a cabinet minister stand up in the Commons and Jess and all the MPs can ask some endless questions about the issues around Gaza, yeah. Palestine, policy on Israel you, you can't do it, can you, Jess, because he's in the other no, place? Usually with foreign affairs, completely different to any other particular policy area, you aren't really there with the foreign secretary trying to catch them out mm. on things. It's not the same in a questioning. It is genuinely an ability for the foreign secretary to hear the sense of the feeling of both members of parliament and people in mm. the country. Mm. And so there is, I, I don't think that the Lords don't do a perfectly good job at this, and I'm sure yeah, they and are. He's, he's, he's turned up a lot. Like yeah, he's, yeah, he's yeah. been asked a lot and he comes a lot. Mm. I, but they're also not elected, I have mm. yeah. to say. What I would say about Cameron, though, he is putting in the absolute hard yards because I think that he made a very accurate and clever calculation that he had basically a year, like he knows the time is running out of him being the foreign secretary, he had a year to do a good job and rehabilitate himself and he has totally successfully done that. Like his his political legacy will be a different one uh, to the one that he was left. And so I think it was wise on his part, absolutely wise. And it's no bother to Rishi Sunak because he's a good statesman and all of that. But I do think that, that in the last few weeks, there has been a little bit more of a rub between the two of them, specifically on the issue of Israel. Just going back to what you said about Britain's place in the world, you know, Rishi Sunak doesn't get praised for much, does he? But but it is fair to say, I think you're on to something there when I think about it too, which is in terms of leadership on Ukraine and in terms of efforts around the Middle East, it's it's hard for the US, the UK, any ally really to know if they can be effective. But But Britain has sort of found a leadership role, haven't they, in terms of security and, and standing with allies and there is a better story to tell right and that is perhaps part of Sunak's legacy as well. I, I think one of the ways that the pair of them are trying to position the UK and bring the UK back into being a serious player at, at multilateral uh, events is to have us almost like that reasonable person test so you know there is an element to which the US has to, in some ways, back Israel because of the nature of their relationship. Actually, the UK can be almost like a, a bellwether to say, yeah, that's OK, but but actually you've gone too far or we need to have more of this. Or, you know, there, there is almost a sense where they're setting themselves up, not as an arbiter, but in terms of being able to test like wh where the boundaries are on mm. some of this stuff and and I, I, that's difficult because you can sometimes get judgments wrong but but i think by and large in an incredibly complex very difficult situation they haven't done much wrong you know actually the the leadership has been quite mm. clear and, and some of the criticisms that we have in other policy areas which is that it is not clear there are not lines of transparency and responsibility it's not communicated well actually in foreign affairs at the moment those criticisms don't really add up. Let's move on to your messages. This is from Lauren in Stoke-on-Trent about Angie Rayner, whose tax affairs, you know, we've talked about a bit. This is what she says. After listening to the Angela Rayner episode and you talking about her being working class, how do we get more working class women involved in politics, not just for the Labour Party, but for all of the parties? I think one of the big problems is that a lot of us see the abuse that those working class women get when they stick their head above the parapet 
and it can put us off. So what would you guys say is the best way that we can move past this and make our politics more welcoming? Jess, you would say you were working class. Well, is I that come fair? From working cl- I yeah. come from a working class background. People think I'm incredibly working class because I've got an accent. Um, I mean, the, the truth is, is that it, we can't currently control the amount of abuse that people get and the level of scrutiny that you get as a, a woman of colour, a woman of a certain class, mm. a woman of a certain size even. Pick pick a thing and a, uh, if you're a woman and you've got one of these things, that you're going to get a load of drubbing. So there needs to be then targeted positivity as well towards those people. I mean, obviously in the Labour Party, we have a rule about the amount of women who uh, have to be elected to positions within, not just elected positions but within the party you need to positively go out and make it so that it works for Mm -hmm. those people but political parties are not good for parents especially Mm -hmm. like meetings are held at seven o'clock at night and things Mm -hmm. or on a Saturday morning when you're meant to be going to the swimming lesson or whatever it is but all I can say is like actually working class women uh, historically in all political parties, including the first ever woman prime minister, if we're honest, was, you know, they have an enormous effect on uh-huh. the actual change in the country. Yeah. And so be inspired by the positive element of it that you can make massive change. Yeah, you can make massive change, can't you, if you actually put yourself yeah. up. And, and and Ruth, you're someone that was a journalist like me, moved on to much better things, bigger things, <laughs> more important things. How would you make politics more welcoming, as Lauren asked? Yeah, I, w- I was I was over the hill. I was done by forty. Do you know, I'm I'm like I'm on my, on my downward trajectory now. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know about I'm that. Just, I'm just a pundit on your podcast, Beth. You're right about the idea that it is, it matters that people can see people like them, that talk like them, that look like them, that are from backgrounds like them. So I, th- I think we do have to make sure that that we show the visible diversity within our parties. If I was to to sort of borrow one policy from any other party. Uh, the Women's Equality Party have a policy where they help with childcare for mm. any of their female candidates that have kids. So that because what you do when you stand for elections mm. is you do evenings and weekends. Like that's mm. that's when you go out yeah. and campaign because that's when people are at home. Uh, and actually, having a really simple policy like that would be helpful because you know not everybody mm. has means. It costs time yeah. and mm. therefore money to be a candidate, mm. and nobody yeah. tells you that. Mm. And, and I think the other thing that I would do is I'll, I'll use this platform and I have used others to say it still matters. Yes, like the abuse is horrendous. You get it, as Jess says, for being a woman. I get it for being fat, for being gay, for being Scottish, for being in the Lords. Like you take a pick. I I just say you're not fat. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's you are kind. not fat. I kind of actually am. <laughs> Tell that to the cartoon writers in Scotland that just used to draw me as a ball. Aww. <laughs> uh, anyway, but but we are, it imp- it's important that we take the opportunity to say mm. that politics still matters mm. and that we want people that care and that it is still worth it. Yes, it can be hard and you've mm. got to prepare your family for it and mm. they shouldn't be dragged in because it's not their name that's on a ballot paper. But it still matters and it's still Mm. worth doing. And you will get support from friends and colleagues and your parties when you Mm. enter it. Absolutely do it, no matter what background you're from. Okay, I love that. We're ending this podcast on working class woman power. What a way to end. Thanks for that, both of you. Now, just quickly, let's wrap up. What are we up to this weekend, Ruth? I am going to be a terribly proud auntie this weekend because my nephew has just been picked for the first time to play uh, rugby league for Scotland wow. in the under 16s for his age group. And I'm going to go down uh, to northeast of England to watch my nephew play rugby. Big shout out there. That is impressive. Yeah, yeah. go Callum. Yeah, go Callum. Good luck. Jess? Uh, yeah, I'll be door knocking all weekend. Uh, we've got the mayoral election in the West mm. Midlands. So, you know, I look forward to people talking to me about all political issues that are not controlled by the mayoral to. Got, I haven't got anything on this weekend. I might go run it. I have nothing on. It's great. Yeah. Well, look, that is all for this week. I hope you all have lovely weekends. And remember, you can WhatsApp voice note us on 07934 200 triple four. That's 07934 200 triple four. Or send an email at electoral dysfunction at sky.uk. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to tell your mates if you enjoy it. Uh, We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.